Welcome back to the Fantasy Football Fellas YouTube channel. My name is Tyler Plath, and today we are going through the eight players that you should let your league mates draft this year. If you let your buddies draft guys like Debo Samuel, Kyle Pitts, Cam Akers, Cortland Sutton because of their inflated ADPs last year, your chances of winning your league increased exponentially. And that's what we're here to do today, to point out those players for this year before we get started if you haven't subscribed to the channel consider doing so it's a great way to show that you liked this video and all our other videos and it's a great way to support the channel so consider doing that if you have not done so already and without further ado let's kick things off with Jalen Waddle. Last year, Jalen Waddle was being drafted as a wide receiver 19 going somewhere between the end of the fourth round beginning of the fifth round and he finished last year as a wide receiver 8. And now this year, he's going as a wide receiver 10, kind of in the beginning of the third round, which sounds about right for a guy that finishes wide receiver 8 last year, for a guy going into his third year in the league. But here's why you need to let your league mates draft Waddle this year. Most of Waddle's fantasy production came from extreme efficiency. Now, efficiency has a place in fantasy football, but in the proper context, when you have the fewest amount of receptions and the fewest amount of targets of all the top 10 wide receivers, but you had the highest yards per reception with 18.1, that's a lot to bank on. Especially when you're the number two option in your own offense and you saw 50 less targets than the number one in your offense. Look, Jalen Waddle is a great football player. He's a great talent. Heck, he was in the top 10 of his own draft class. But what I'm trying to say is that the efficiency that we saw from last year just screams for regression for this year. And because of that, you should let your league mates draft him at that third round draft capital, especially when you can get guys like Chris Olave and Devontae Smith after Waddle at a much more reasonable price because they can offer relatively the same amount of fantasy production but you're getting them at a slightly better price than where Waddle is going right now. Next guy on this list is Jaguars running back Travis Etienne. And if you haven't heard it on this channel from either myself, Lucas, or Cameron, we are not in on Travis Etienne at his current ADP of running back 12. Running back 12. After he finished as the running back 17 overall last year, but the running back 23 in fantasy points per game. That's more than enough of a reason, but I'll explain it even more to further prove the point. ETN was 19th in opportunity share. He was 27th in route participation, which isn't very good for the receiving threat that everyone thinks that Travis ETN is. Now you look at this year, he faces more competition in his own backfield with Tank Bigsby. So the opportunity share, how much can it really get better? Not by a whole lot. He has another receiver on his team that's going to be vying for targets in Kelvin Ridley. So you put a you put a ceiling and a cap on the receiving production when he was already only 27th in route participation. That doesn't sound great. And he has a coach and a play caller who has been very vocal this offseason about using multiple backs and has a history of using running back committees in Doug Peterson. ETN is going to get less volume this year in both the rushing attack and the passing game. And while he can be efficient with what he gets, he won't get enough volume to return value at that running back 12 spot. Next guy we're going to talk about is another second year running back in Kenneth Walker, who goes off the board as a running back 16 in the middle to end of the third round, sometimes even fall into the fourth round. And the reason why you need to let your league mates draft Kenneth Walker instead of you this year is because his he's in a very similar situation to Travis Etienne. It's added competition, not only in Zach Charbonnet, but Jackson Smith and Jigba. So a decrease in targets, which weren't really that great to begin with, and carries maybe on the way down this year because of the competition. Now, Walker figures to be the early down back 
in the the red zone threat or at least the goal line threat between him and Charbonnet. So there's still there, there's still value, and it kind of checks out that Seattle may use him this way based on what they did last year. Right, Walker was third in red zone touches, so they clearly trust him when they get into the red zone and closer to the goal line. And he was third in breakaway runs, and and breakaway runs are solely just runs of 15 yards or more. And you don't really typically run for 15 yards or more on third downs. Again, typically. Sometimes you get a third and one that you can kind of break loose. But again, you typically see those on early downs. So there's still value with Walker this year. But that value, because of all the added competition, that value is probably going to be closer to 20 maybe even 25, some people may argue, than it is to 15, right? Again, he's going as a running back 16. So if he starts to slide in your drafts, that's much more fair and much more reasonable than where he's currently going. But with little to no receiving upside and potentially less rushing opportunities, maybe it stays the same as last year, it's hard to buy in where he's currently going in drafts. Moving right along here to our next player, who is another running back, Eagles running back, DeAndre Swift. And Swift is low-key a fascinating player this year because of the situation. Swift is currently going at the end of the fifth round, sometimes beginning of the sixth round as the running back 21. But he's a part of a three-headed backfield with himself, Rashad Penny, and Kenny Gainwell. Putting the three-headed monster backfield aside, he's just not a clean scheme fit with Philly's offense. Swift has predominantly been used as a receiving threat in Detroit. He hasn't topped 650 rushing yards in a single season, and over 53% of his career fantasy points have come from the receiving game. And now he goes into the offense that threw to their running backs the least last year. And actually, Swift alone, single-handedly, out-targeted all the Eagles running backs combined. So there's a chance that we see 30-40% to regression in the receiving department because Philly just doesn't throw to their running backs. And that's partially because of Jalen Hurts being the quarterback. Now, the other part about Swift is that he hasn't played a full season in his entire career. The most games that he's played in a single season is 14. So he's missed at least three games every single year. So with extra competition, right, Rashad Penny and, and Kenny Gainwell, and you know, we'll see how it all plays out towards, you know, the end of training camp because Rashad Penny doesn't really cost the Eagles anything if they let him go. And who knows about Kenny Gainwell? But as things stand right now, there's extra competition and just not a clean scheme fit. Again, as a receiving back in an offense that doesn't throw to their running backs, don't target him. If he slides, again, much more reasonable, much more understandable. But let your league mates get excited about the new lead back in Philly. Because what we saw last year, Miles Sanders as the quote-unquote lead back finishes a running back 15. So let your league mates get excited about that and say, hey, there's a chance that he can return on value. Because what I'm trying to say is, it's not as simple as that. And I don't think there's a world where we see DeAndre Swift have a kind of season that we saw Miles Sanders have last year. Next guy on this list is a 2022 fantasy football darling. It's Damian Pierce, who currently goes as a running back 20. Pierce had a nice stretch of games last year where he was a running back 14 from weeks 3 to 10, and he was sixth in opportunity shares of all running backs across the entire season, which is really, which was great to see. But here's what we need to know for this year when it comes to Damian Pierce. The Texans went out and signed Devin Singletary. And there's only two words to describe what that means. Split backfield. Pierce figures to get the early down work and the goal line work kind of like Kenneth Gainwell, excuse me, Kenneth Walker. But the issue is that this Texans team will be playing from behind a lot. So that early down work and goal line work is relatively capped. You know, you'll see early down work earlier in the games, but when they need to start coming back, we're not going to see a whole lot of Damian Pierce. And it's not even a for it's not even a, you know, a guarantee that they get into the red zone when they're making their comeback. So who knows what the goal line work even looks like for Damian Pierce. Looking back at last year, 
Damien Pierce was very dependent on volume, it, which, like, yes, that's how things work. But let me tell you how drastic it was. In games with 20 or more touches, which was seven of his 13 games, Pierce averaged 16.8 fantasy points, which that's really, really good to see. And again, makes sense. More touches, more opportunity. And he, he returned on those opportunities with 16.8 fantasy points a game. But in the games with less than 20 touches, which was the remaining six games of the 13, he averaged 8.3 fantasy points a game. Literally half. That drastic of a fall off is too extreme to ignore. So you may not think that Devin Singletary is that good, but he's good enough to at least take away whatever kind of receiving work was there for Damian Pierce and some carries here and there from Pierce. And, and based on what we saw from Pierce last year, that doesn't bode too well for him this year because he needs a lot of the ball to be productive in fantasy. All right, we're switching it over to wide receivers and we're going to end the video with three straight wide receivers. And first is going to be Mike Evans. And here's the deal with Mike Evans. He doesn't have Tom Brady throwing him the ball anymore, and instead he has Baker Mayfield. Everyone knows that going from Tom Brady to Baker Mayfield is a downgrade. So both Mike Evans and Chris Godwin are reeling a bit in ADP because of that. But Baker has to throw the ball to somebody. And I expect those guys to be Chris Godwin and Rashad White rather than Mike Evans. And I know that sounds ludicrous, but let me explain. Baker paced all quarterbacks last year with the highest check down rate with 11.9%. And he played for two different teams. And he had one of the fewest passing attempts of quarterbacks that played in, I don't remember, six games, I think it was. He had 330 pass attempts. So uh, almost 12% of those attempts were check downs. That bodes really well for Rashad White. And Baker isn't the worst at the deep ball, which is where we have primarily seen Mike Evans in, you know, recent memory with Tom Brady. But Baker isn't the greatest at completing passes. He he, he boasts a 61.4% career completion percentage, which isn't super great at all. So it's really a matter of does new offensive coordinator Dave Canales, who comes over from Seattle, does he let Baker throw the ball downfield enough to Evans? Because if we see a decrease in deep targets, it'll likely, it'll likely result, excuse me, in a decrease in fantasy production for Evans. And I think it's safe to predict a decrease in those deep targets. As we get closer to drafts, you're going to hear a lot of Mike Evans has put up over a thousand yards in every single season with various quarterbacks. And you'll also hear he's, he has still finished inside the top 25 in years where he has scored less than six touchdowns. Ignore all that noise. Because at the end of the day, a bet on Mike Evans is a bet on Baker Mayfield, and there are much better bets to make than Mike Evans. Second to last guy on this list is Debo Samuel, the wide receiver 38 from last year, who is currently going in the third round of drafts this year. And... Look, it's, it's fair to say the last year was a disaster for Debo, right? He had 20 less receptions. He had 30 less targets, 800 less receiving yards, and 140 less rushing yards than 2021. Now, we were going to see regression, but I don't think anyone predicted that amount of regression. And what makes things even murkier for Debo going into this year is the quarterback situation in San Francisco. Right, Brock Purdy has gotten the votes of confidence to be the starter if he's healthy. But if he's not healthy for week one, it's the Trey Lance or Sam Darnold show. And there's an argument to be made that Debo performed better when Trey Lance was the quarterback. So maybe there's some optimism for the first couple weeks until Brock Purdy comes back. What we saw last year between Debo and Brock Purdy wasn't great. It really wasn't that great. We only saw them play in three games, so you know make make of it what you will with the small sample size. But in the three games that they played together, Debo finished as the wide receiver 33, the wide receiver 24, and the wide receiver 72. Granted, he's coming back from injury in that last game, but it 
it, it's, he wasn't targeted when he was back. So the mystique of Debo will always be there because what if he bounces back? What if we get another 2021 season? Don't fall for the trap. And I've said that about every player I've talked about so far, but again, don't fall for that trap. Let your league mates draft him. Let them believe in a bounce back or another 2021 season for Debo because he's not worth third round draft capital this year. And the last player on this list is Chiefs wide receiver Kadarius Tony. And Tony is purely about just looking ahead because what we saw last year and the limited action that he had with the Chiefs, there's just not enough that you can make a concrete, you know, argument based on what we saw last year. So again, looking ahead for this year, a lot of people are expecting him to be the Chiefs wide receiver one in a wide receiver room with guys like Marquez Valdez Scantling with Sky Moore, who has reportedly been getting most of the slot snaps so far this offseason, Ricky Rasheed Rice, Richie James, who the Chiefs signed this offseason, and Justin Watson. So at least on paper, it kind of checks out to have Tony be the wide receiver one in this offense. So why is it that people are so hesitant on Tony at this point? And I think the best way to explain that is just by the phrase high risk, high reward. You know, it, it we could see him be the true wide receiver one in this offense and see 90 plus targets that are vacated by Juju Smith and Miko Hardman's departures. Or he is just the next Miko Hardman and just the next gadget guy in this offense. Because we go back to this wide receiver room again, and besides maybe Richie James, which there's really no, you know, no evidence to make this argument about Richie James, there's no one else that fits the gadget guy role like Kadarius Tony. Maybe like the next guy up would be Richie James in my opinion, but that's not even a guarantee. So if there is a guy that fits that description, it's Kadarius Tony. So again, Tony is the high risk, high reward option this year. And as we get closer and closer to preseason and the start of the season, you'll hear a lot of people start saying, why is the wide receiver one for the Kansas City Chiefs going so late? That's a steal, especially when you have Patrick Mahomes throwing you the ball, which sure, there's an argument to be made there. But the wide receiver one last year for the Chiefs, Juju Smith-Schuster, was going right around the same range, and he finished as a wide receiver 27 last year. Maybe the better way to explain it is this. Just because you're the wide receiver one on the Kansas City Chiefs, does not automatically make you the number one pass catching option in that offense because that role is pretty much reserved for Travis Kelsey at this point. That wraps up another video on the Fantasy Football Fellas YouTube channel and a quick recap of the eight players we discussed in this video. Jalen Waddell, Travis Etienne, Kenneth Walker, DeAndre Swift, Damian Pierce, Mike Evans, Debo Samuel, and Kadarius Tony. Each of these players still has value, and I hope you picked up on that theme in the video. They're not necessarily avoids, because if they slip in your drafts, they could they become much more reasonably priced. But as things stand, let your league mates draft these guys at their current ADP so you can better your chances of winning your league. Thanks for tuning in again. Give this video a like and subscribe if you haven't already to get even more videos like this every single week. And go ahead and put in the comment section who you are letting your buddies draft so you can give yourself a better chance of winning your league. We will see you next week with even more videos. So until then, deuces.